back or welcome to the Squiggly Careers podcast. I am Helen, I'm one of the hosts and I'm here with my other host, Sarah. Hi everyone. And this is episode 109, which has absolutely no ring to it whatsoever of our, <laughs> of our podcast. But thank you. I wonder if anyone has listened to all 109 episodes. Sarah, oh. what do you think? I don't know. I know that we've, we've definitely got some super squiggly fans who get in touch and tell us how useful it's been or really kindly leave us a review, which is always amazing and really appreciated. I would love someone to let us know if they have listened to all 109 and <laughs> whether we've got any better over time. <laughs> yeah, I think that. And I also feel that if someone's really listened to 109 episodes... They'll know probably quite a lot about us. <laughs> yeah, and also they might know more than us. Sometimes people say to me, oh... On that yeah, podcast that you did on interviews, that model, that three-stage model, and I'm like, remember the model, remember the model really quickly. <laughs> I think I can't <laughs> remember everything off the top of my head, but I'm sure if you've listened to 109, you're like part of the team. At some uh, point, so... I do feel like if you listened to them all and then wrote the stuff down, that would be useful. That is yeah. like something I've got in the back of my head about how do you convert that into <laughs> something. Maybe that's the next book, eh? <laughs> I definitely feel that could be book number two, basically just <laughs> writing down transcripts from our podcasts <laughs> without some of the irrelevant chat that we you know. Like, we also enjoy yeah (laughs) and I think there could be some people that are listening to this podcast for the very first time so um, as well as saying our name so Helen and Sarah you now know who we are let's tell you what the podcast is all about before we get into what we're going to talk about today so the Squiggly Careers podcast is really all about helping you to take control of all the twists and turns and ups and downs that happen in the careers that we are all experiencing today, which we call squiggly careers, where there's lots of change and ambiguity, but also loads and loads of opportunity. And we believe in our organisation, Amazing If, that that if people can take control of their career and also develop the right skills and have the right tools, then actually we can make work better for everyone. And that's what we're all about. And our podcast, uh, the Squiggly Careers podcast, is just one way that we try and help people each week. So thank you for being here if it is your first time. And we hope that this helps you. And something new that we've got um, that anyone can join is our Squiggly Careers community on Facebook. So this is completely free. You do have to answer a few questions before you are submitted into the group. That sounds so um, harsh, doesn't it? You have to... I know, but there are any questions just to check that you really care about personal development, which everybody who bothers to listen to this podcast will absolutely fly through. And that's really a peer-to-peer community that we've set up to help people with career development questions, conundrums, crises. Um, (laughs) Obviously, we're both on there. And it's something really new that we've just started trying out. And people are definitely all learning, hopefully, a bit from us, all from each other. We post some resources on there. So I guess it is quite a nice build to the podcast. And it's set up as a Facebook group. I know some people have used groups loads. I'm actually quite new to using groups, but finding them really helpful. So if that's something you think might be useful, you like using groups, you like Facebook, or you just like to give it a try, you feel like you'd like to come and hang out with us for a little bit and talk all things careers, just head over to Facebook, search for Squiggly Career Community and you'll find us. I'll also put the link in the show notes. So where oh yeah, that's, to this that's well. the easy way to do it. <laughs> It'll be there. So today's topic of the podcast, then we're going to be talking about career conversations. And it felt like quite an apt time of year to do it because a lot of organisations tend to have these conversations either towards the end of the calendar year. So coming into December or at the start of the next one. So in, in January, a lot of the companies that we work with tend to schedule these conversations then. But I think I would say actually that I hope by the end of this podcast that one thing we can really set in stone with people is that it shouldn't just be a one time of year thing but it's probably on lots of people's minds at the moment so that's why we're covering it now and there are a couple of stats when we did our research for the episode that are worth just reflecting on as why this is such an important topic to cover some research that's been done by right management which is a division of manpower they did a global career conversation study so it was a very apt study in 2016 and a couple of things that really came out of that that stuck with me were that 82 percent of employees so eight in ten of us would be more engaged in our work if our managers had regular career conversations with us 75% of people, so three quarters of people, would be more likely to stay at their current company if they received ongoing professional development. But only 16% of people said that they have ongoing conversations with their managers about their careers. And when I looked into some other studies as well, it said that women actually seem to be disproportionately affected by the lack of career conversations happening. And there was a really only only a quarter of women were having a career conversation with their manager about how to develop leadership skills. People want to have it. 
They stay at their companies when they have them. The vast majority of people aren't having ongoing career conversations. And women in particular are not having career conversations which talk about leadership skills. There's a real worrying gap, I think, between what people really want from work and the conversations and what they're actually experiencing. And I think something really useful to think about is the difference between having a career conversation and a performance review. And actually, in the last two companies that I've worked in, they started to split these conversations out very distinctly. But often I do think they are still together. So to just expand on that a little bit more, performance conversations tend to be backward looking. So how have I done this year? How have I done versus my objectives? What progress have I made? Those kind of things, which actually I think are probably more familiar to us than career conversations because they do tend to cover the day to day of how you're doing in your job. You know, what you're doing really well, how you can improve. I think career conversations are future facing. So they're all about where you're going, what you might need to learn, what you might need to know to get there, what that might look like. I think they are more exploratory. They are probably less specific in some ways because you're not going through kind of a number of different objectives. And often when the two get married together, I think you get in quite difficult territory because you're trying to do, it's almost like the two for the price of one thing. You're trying to have kind of two conversations at once. And I think if you are a leader listening to this and you have the ability to divide out those conversations, I would really encourage you to do it. I've certainly led teams in two places where that's exactly what we did and that worked really well. And part of the reason I think this works so well is it gives you more space to have a career conversation without the pressure of like a performance review, because performance reviews often do feel whether they're very linked to things like promotions or salary increases or those kind of things. And at that point, you might not feel very ready to have, you know, a more general career conversation. So if you're a leader who can divide them up, great. Or if you're just working in an organisation where you think, well, at the moment, it's not very clear which of those I'm having. Perhaps that's something that actually you can talk to your manager about and say, oh, you know, I'd almost like to have a separate conversation specifically about my career more generally and to sort of talk to you a bit about what I'm thinking. And I was thinking about why these conversations matter so much generally and I think in squiggly careers where now these career conversations, I think, can take us in so many more directions. So previously, these conversations were probably relatively straightforward, which is why they were probably joined together with performance reviews it was sort of what's the next job at Woods and how do I get there and I can think of career conversations I've had that were as straightforward as that and there was no exploring possibilities which we always advocate there was no thinking about sideways moves or secondments or anything like that so yeah I came up with these three s's about why these conversations matter so much which are sponsorship spotting and strengths and this is really I think to do with the role of kind of your manager as part of these conversations and why your manager is so critical. So sponsorship is the importance of the role of your manager as a sponsor for you, somebody who can advocate for you when you're not in the room. And often it's said that sponsorship is more important than mentorship. And actually, back to Helen's point on women, specifically for women who often have less sponsors and more mentors. And your manager is someone who knows you really well. And I think if they can sponsor you, that's where they can open up new things on your behalf. And that's number two, which is spotting. I've certainly experienced this, that when people know you well and know what your aspirations are, your manager and their peers and your conversations don't always necessarily have to be with your manager, but they can spot things that you can't see, that you don't know are opportunities, actually both internal and external sometimes you just don't know what people know and they don't know what they can see, what conversations that they're part of. And so you need to talk to your manager about these things because they can't help you if they don't know what's important to you. And then strengths. I think these career conversations are a really good opportunity to make sure that you're sharing your strengths, making sure that you're getting feedback from your manager in terms of is your intent to use your strengths showing up? Is it having the impact that you were hoping? Are you adding value in the right areas? And can they then see how that would be valuable in the future in different kind of opportunities? So I think just bear that in mind in terms of how valuable these conversations are. And I think when we talk about our stories in a minute about how we've had these conversations, I think these conversations can go in so many different directions. But if you think about, well, that's what I'm hoping to achieve as an outcome from this conversation in terms of what could your manager go away and do for you on your behalf, if they could sponsor you, spot opportunities, 
and promote your kind of strengths to others, I think that's a pretty good outcome. And so what we're going to talk about in this week's podcast is we're going to share some stories, some sort of insights into career conversations that we've had. And then we're going to go through some top tips. So specific things that you can do to take control of that career conversation and make it as effective as possible. And then we've got a listener question. So we put um, a, a request for questions out on Instagram where we're just at Amazing If. And we've got one that we would like to answer for people in this week's episode. So shall we start with our story, Sarah? Let's. Okay, so I had a manager who actually sort of had a, almost like a reverse career conversation. So rather than me talking to them about my aspirations and what I wanted to do and how I was sort of thinking about it, they shared it with me. So I think they were trying to help me to understand how to approach thinking about my career. They were basically saying to me, this particular person was quite motivated by monetary things. So for example, on their career development plan, they had a particular car that they wanted to get and no like, no judgment whatsoever. It was just some of the things that are important to them. This individual showed me, this is where I am at the moment. These are some of the things that I want to explore. These are some of the, like, the milestones I've got and some of them were personal. They had family things on there. They had some of these material things, but they basically really really showed me their career thinking and I thought I don't think it happens very often I feel like this is often exists in a vacuum where you're just sat there thinking what is I want to learn where do I want to go and you maybe share it with your manager maybe you also share it with a mentor but very rarely does somebody else and very very rarely does your manager Mm. ever share their thinking about them back with you both so you can understand them better and also just see you know, what they're thinking about, what their timelines are, what their ambitions are. And it was just, you know, we sometimes talk about the importance of transparency, but through that conversation, I had transparency. I had quite a lot of trust because I felt like someone shared something really personal with me. And I also learnt about how different people are and their different motivations and how that's absolutely fine. And there isn't one size fits all kind of model Mm. of what a good career development looks like. And it's so interesting because I think when you were describing that, I was thinking that's a really selfish thing for that person to have done (laughs) because you often don't get that much time with your manager not to have these kind of conversations. And I was thinking, well, they've just basically taken that time for themselves. But actually, it does show the importance of role modelling, I think. Mm. And, you know, we always say, leaders, you have to be really aware of the shadow that you cast, you know, how your actions then impact the people around you much more than you can probably ever appreciate or anticipate. And so probably by having that one conversation, that person had showed you that they take it seriously, they showed you their thinking, how they'd done it. And I guess that probably gave you the permission to do the same. And I think sometimes people do feel like they need permission to do these sorts of things well I think one thing I particularly remember and I think maybe it was one of the things that sparked it is in that company that I was working in there was like a career conversation or a career development plan template that was quite rigid and you know really blocky what do you want to do by when how are you going to do you know one of those very specific plans and this I think that might have been what triggered it this my manager said oh I don't use that (laughs) like let me show you what (laughs) I use and I remember it was like a word document like basically a brain dump there was like no there was no like tables or any kind of structure I think there may have been a few bullets I think that was what sparked the conversation they were like this is how I do it this is why it's meaningful this is how I use it and so I yeah I really found it helpful because to see somebody kind of going well the most important thing is that you have a career conversation and some idea of career development is actually useful and if following some rigid template doesn't do it for you then find a way to make it work for you and I've subsequently Ooh. like developed my own template um, Me too. and I think that was the moment that I realized that you could do that because as long as you have something that is meaningful for you and that you can use in a conversation then that's the most important thing not completing the PDR and doing the annual conversation tick box thing. Yeah it's hard isn't it because I sort of feel like I don't want anyone's career conversation to be templated but often organizations have to give people some sort of structure and framework but then people Mm. often don't you know I remember so many people are reluctant because it feels like filling out a form versus having a meaningful conversation and I think getting that balance right is so hard because I was thinking I think for me career conversations often go one of three ways one I come away I'm always really like anticipate them I think I think about them a lot as you can (laughs) imagine I've reflected a lot I take them really seriously probably like too seriously I've definitely had quite a few where I just come away feeling really disappointed where I got outcomes in mind that I was hoping we were going to talk about or topics we were going to cover and maybe that person wasn't that prepared or didn't seem that bothered or perhaps been late. 
I think the other times where I've got it wrong, which is definitely me not taking enough ownership and accountability, is where I've just had what I would describe as a nice career chat. Mm. I always have like a really high risk of doing this because I'll have a really lovely conversation, but I often come away then feeling a bit vague about what to do next or yeah. where I'm going. And that's because I'm particularly, I think probably earlier in my career, you know, I wasn't particularly confident being direct or asking direct questions. You're always quite aware of the kind of the manager employee relationship. And I think actually I was probably overly respectful of that. And so you'd have these sort of chats and I'd come away and go, mm, okay, well, I'm not really sure what I'm going to go away and do now. And the best ones I did, and, you know, maybe I've got something in, in common with the person that you were describing, was where I still filled out the template. So I'm not that much of a rule breaker that I would mm -hmm. ignore the template. So the template was done, but then I turned up with basically my strengths and my values, red, amber, greened, mm -hmm. and, and described why they were red, amber, green on this kind of spectrum. So I'd outline my strengths outline my values, what each of them meant to me and where I thought I was and why and what I thought I could do about that. Because my logic by this point, and yeah, this was certainly a bit further into my career, was it is in everybody's benefit if those things are as green as possible because that's how you'll get the most value from me. And I remember that one career chat was so much more pointed and personalised mm. because actually the greens, you can sort of go, OK, would well, you feel confident continuing to sort of do what you do what you're doing but let's have a really focused chat about the ambers or the reds and why we're not getting those things and, and why that's not happening in those roles and I actually feel that's what you and I do a little bit now when we're doing our maybe we should have be having career chats with each other I don't even know how that's going to work but we do talk about this a bit in terms of going how much are we like living our values how much we're living our strengths in our roles now running amazing if and I find that incredibly useful and powerful when we're trying to figure out what our roles and responsibilities are together so yeah it is funny because we don't have managers anymore we just have each other and so some of those <laughs> things that would be like in a big company like that you're you're managed by somebody and that there's like this regular rhythm I do think there's a question for ourselves about whether we put some of that rhythm back into how we're working but we'll save it for our December review meeting yes that we're, we, we have an annual meeting everybody where we yeah, like we do, do that yeah. yeah one December we just like basically get a lot of post-its out and plan the year ahead and also do some like what went well, even better if of the year. Just off by going back to that vague conversations point that you said, so I've definitely resonated with me. I think one thing that I have become a lot better at, in case it helps anybody listening, is I've been, become much better at the email follow-up to people. And what I mean mm. by that is, let's say I've had a conversation with somebody and I'm like, okay, that was quite an interesting conversation. Like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. It was quite interesting. I forced myself to sit down and write myself like some bullet points and really reflect on what they said and I try and turn it into something even if it's like three or four like motivational statements or just one action or something I try and like translate the vague conversation into something vaguely actionable and then I play that back to the person and just say like I've done that in the last week actually I kind of go thanks very much for your time like really interesting to me these are the three things I'm taking away from our conversation and then you know would like to stay in touch or thank you for your time or whatever the follow-up is but I find that that a just helps me to get some kind of value like in those couple of bullet points is something that I can go back to but also I don't know, just goes back to the person and tries to turn it into something actionable and meaningful so that they think it was a good use of their time as well yeah, and I've had almost like that done to me as a manager, where people have been proactive enough to send those emails to me. And actually, they are also really useful prompts as a manager, because it does help to just consolidate that conversation. You're probably as a manager having multiple conversations. And it helps you to also be really clear about is there anything that you committed to that you need mm -hmm. to help to support that person with. And I think it does also prompt the kind of ongoing nature. You know, we were talking before about like, let's try and get away from these being kind of very formalised once a year or twice a year conversations. If you suddenly follow up by you just sending that email that you sent this week, actually that makes it more than just a one off thing. Mm -hmm. And then actually it would be something to refer back to and it would be a way to continue the conversation, I think, in some way. And I think for that person, maybe to use that with somebody else, because I think sometimes when people are helping you, they're just sort of speaking and thinking, speaking and thinking, yeah. and they're not necessarily really clear on 
what did I say that was of value? And, and then I, I try and make someone feel smart or that this is great advice or this is really actionable and play it back to them so they can maybe use that with somebody else, but maybe a bit more consciously. So uh, <laughs> and It's almost like thinking in like magazine um, yeah. top tips, isn't it? I think yeah. the way you're describing I, it. I think that's just my brain, isn't it? Like, <laughs> it is definitely your brain. Top tips machine. And, and on so, top tips. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, an unintentional segue. Shall we start? So we've got six top tips, but I feel like the one that we should start with is the one that we've referred to a few times about career conversations are not a one hit wonder it's unrealistic to expect that you're going to solve everything in one conversation that puts a lot of pressure on you thinking about it it puts a lot of pressure on the individual that you're having that conversation with it would create too many actions and you wouldn't achieve them so let's get out of thinking I've got to have one career conversation a year and think about this as a series of conversations and I was reading some articles about how you can break this down actually it was a manpower article um, that I will link as a pdf when we post about this podcast on our website amazingif.com but it talks about three areas that you could talk about in a career conversation and each one of these areas could represent a different career conversation that you could have either in a series of conversations with the same person or just three separate career conversations so the first conversation was all around who am I and it was about you know thinking about what your values are what your motivations are and having sort of a deep reflective conversation so that's sort of what Sarah's saying about the values and and having a red amber green status and just a conversation about you what's important to you what motivates and drives you conversation one also how that connects to your work conversation two is about what and how should you develop in so whether that might be harder skills technical skills or whether it might be softer more transferable skills having a conversation with somebody about these are the areas that you think are important, these are the areas that they think are important, have they got ideas about how you could do it, is there budget, could they give you time, all the things that you might want to talk about, but that is a very effective conversation for number two. And while I was reading different articles as well, it talked about a model called the 50-25-25 model of experience, exposure and education. But this is effectively, when you're thinking about what should you develop and how should you develop in your current role, it said 50% of that should be focused on the experience. So your day-to-day job, what different projects are you taking on, how are you working, what teams are you working with, all that kind of stuff. 25% should be on about exposure. So in order to develop, are there different people that you need to be exposed with, maybe different disciplines, and just thinking about how you're going to do that. And 25% is about education. So are there some specific things that you need to learn and how might you do that? And that could be online courses, going to events, formal learning, self-directed learning, maybe you buy yourself some books whatever it looks like but I think that isn't also an interesting thing that you could talk about with the person you're having the career conversation with is what your perception of the 50 25 25 model looks like across experience exposure and education and also what their perspective on it is as well and the third conversation suggested was really this what's next for me and what are my career possibilities so that more kind of future focus what are the areas that I could explore what might be within this company what might be without outside of this company how realistic are some of those things have I got any knowledge gaps all that territory but the who am I what and how should I develop and what's next for me what are my possibilities they are the three conversations that could make a series of career conversations When you're talking about what you would like to do next, talk about possibilities rather than plans. And I think this is for two reasons. A, we would always encourage you to think more about possibilities and exploring possibilities because in squiggly careers, everybody's moving so much more frequently and fluidly through organisations, different industries, different types of work. We don't think plans are a good way now to think about careers and career development. Also, a really practical point, every time... I've certainly talked more about kind of possibilities and and more in kind of general terms and been less specific about I want to move jobs in the next three months. I think it helps your manager to relax a little bit and not panic that you're about to leave. And I think I got this wrong, I think, earlier in my career because I was ambitious and I wanted to progress. But if you're sitting there with a manager who perhaps isn't as enlightened, maybe, and who's thinking, crikey, the last thing I need is some this person to leave, because hopefully you're doing a good job. But if you're going, right, well, in six months' time, I just want to get promoted, then managers feel like they're being put on the spot. They maybe panic a bit that you're going to leave. 
and you don't want people to feel like you're not committed to what you're currently doing. So this is quite a nuanced thing, but I think I certainly had much more successful career conversations with my managers when I stopped just going, oh, I want that job or I want that promotion, which was unrealistic anyway, because even when I did those things, those things never worked out. (laughs) That wasn't what I ever ended up doing. So (laughs) I've, I've got so many career plans that never came to fruition. It's incredible. Whereas when I started to just say, I'm looking for jobs that would mean I would get to do more of this thing or would give me this kind of experience, I'm not that worried about what the job title is or exactly what that looks like in terms of where that might sit within a team, it just shows that you are thinking more creatively, more laterally about what you might end up doing. You will find your manager, A, feels more comfortable, but also more confident in helping you and don't feel like they're kind of being put under a lot of pressure of, well, if she doesn't find a new role in three months, she's just going to leave. Now, you might end up doing that anyway, and that's okay. It's just a better way to start and just address these kind of conversations with your manager. And Sarah mentioned there about helping your manager, and that links to tip number three, which is really you want to help your manager, not just because you might like them, but also because you want to help them to help you. So springing on them a career conversation and not giving them any context (laughs) is not setting that up to succeed. So let's say I was going to have that career possibility conversation and my manager just thought I was about to talk about, I don't know, my day-to-day performance. I've not given them any chance to think about opportunities or maybe to go and get some strength-based feedback about when I'm at my best from my stakeholders or anything so that we can have a meaningful conversation in the moment and Sarah mentioned earlier that like your manager's time is at a premium those career conversations like they're not going to happen all the time even with the most committed manager in the world because they're probably managing other people and their own career and their own job so you really want to make the most of those conversations when you're having them and dropping your manager in it is when you just happen to have that meeting with them is not going to help them to help you so give them a heads up and I think that links really nicely to tip number four which is remembering that this is a conversation, not a kind of one-way download of what you're thinking. And so you want your manager to be giving you feedback. I think if you asked Helen or I for feedback about your performance, if you were working with us, I think we would actually both respond in really different ways based on whether or not we'd been given any time to reflect on this. So I'm a really reflective person. I am definitely a better manager when I know that somebody would like feedback from me and I can spend some time thinking really hard about examples, where they show up really well, where they're using their strengths. And if somebody wanted some feedback from me in person, which I would always be really happy to give, I would like to know that definitely before that meeting because then the quality of my feedback would be so much better. I was thinking though, Helen, actually, I think you're so good on the spot. This would probably be less of a big deal for you. So I was wondering, would, would this matter for you as much as it would for me? With the time, no, I call, so I get some people who ask me for feedback on Instagram sometimes. Um, and <laughs> I don't know. Really, I'm trying to think about different ones. Some people have sent me stuff and then, or, or um, cool. I'll tell you what it is. On Instagram stories, a couple of people have messaged me saying, I'm going to do my first Instagram story. Or someone's even sent me their TED talk before. And they said, can I have some feedback from you on it? I know I always feel like, please don't everybody do this because I'll be deluged. But I always feel like when someone asks me, I really want to commit to it. And so I'm like, yes, absolutely. And I try and do it as quickly as possible so it doesn't get lost in, you know, all the other things that Mm. we're doing. But I always try and do one, what work well, and then one, even better if, which again, that's Mm. the framework that we use and works for us. But I think on that asking for feedback, you know, when we're talking about there's a difference between performance management and these career conversations because performance management looks back. I think that's a bit like what worked well. That's like the performance management bit, what worked well, the looking back. And then the even better if is sort of like the looking forward bit for people. And I think Mm. if you do that well, like I always feel like when I'm doing even better if for someone, I really think hard about an idea for them and like an opportunity for what they can do and how like I really connect with I think this would be really good and and it's sort of I feel like I have added value to them in a way rather than just reflecting on oh when you did this it was a bit you know you talked too fast or whatever I said but to answer your first question I'm all right at being put on the spot and I find that that framework particularly helps me to do it because Mm. I think as long as I give one for each of them but I really focus on giving somebody a new idea that I hope they might not have even thought of in their even better ifs. And I think just 
on that when you are asking for feedback from your manager, whether you tee up beforehand and you'll be able to judge this based on who you work for. Remember that this is feedback based on your career conversation, not based on your objectives and your performance. Because mm. this, is, I think, is a potentially risky one. This is where you could get into projects and lose yourself in kind of the day to day. I think if I was asking for feedback in terms of a career conversation, I would be doing it, positioning it and framing it around, oh, I'm interested in doing these kind of roles in the future. What are the skills do you think I might need to learn or strengthen that would really help me to do that or can you see anything any challenges for that just from your experience ask your managers for their points of view for their opinions for their reflections you know you can choose what you want to do with those but I think just be careful on that one that you don't get into switching the conversation into performance review tip number five then and that is that these conversations don't always have to be with your manager and I know that we've talked about managers quite a lot because I think in organizations that's typically who you are probably planning these conversations with but also think about peers mentors Sarah's mentioned sponsors I think if you can have these conversations these career conversations with a broad network of people then actually you can get some more insight you can get more ideas, you can definitely get more perspective. And also it will help you to increase the regularity of these conversations because you might not get your manager, you know, maybe you have one of these detailed one of these conversations once a quarter, but actually maybe once a month, you could be having some form of career conversation. If you just start to think a bit more broadly about who it might be valuable to have those conversations with. And our final tip is go into these conversations really clear about what you want to learn, why, and how the person who you're having that conversation with can help you. I will never forget having a career conversation with somebody who was a sponsor, but not my manager. Probably started off being too vague, as per the earlier chat. Mm -hmm. And within five minutes, she'd said, Sarah, tell me how I can help you. And I didn't have a succinct or really good answer to that. And I think I got there in the end and she was forgiving and encouraging and supportive. I'll ever be grateful for that. (laughs) And I got better over time. But I think make sure you've done the thinking beforehand. I was almost wondering whether if you have a half an hour chat with your manager or an hour chat with your manager, I would almost double that amount of time that you should spend before preparing and thinking for that conversation as a ratio almost as like a two to one ratio because you have to put in the work for yourself and I think if you take ownership for this stuff think about it thoughtfully deeply don't see it as a one the one-off conversation you will just end up getting so much more value from it and I think I can really reflect on the key turning point probably about halfway through my number of working years so far where I started to do that that's how much sort of time I would be putting in before these conversations And it's probably no surprise that those conversations ended up being way better as a result. So before we go on to answer one of our listeners' questions, let's just recap on our six top tips for you for career conversations. So number one is that career conversations are not a one-hit wonder. Number two is when you're talking about your roles, talk about possibilities versus plans. Number three is to help your manager to help you. Number four is to make sure you ask for feedback. Number five is to know these conversations don't always have to be with your manager. And number six is whoever these conversations are with, be clear about what you want to learn and how they can help you. Let's talk about our listener question. So we had one person ask us what I think is a really useful and insightful question that definitely has been something that sprung to mind for me before, which is when you are in a new job... How quickly can you have these kind of conversations with your manager? Because you might be so keen to start chatting about learning and growth and all the things you want to do. But you are mindful of thinking, oh, I don't want to be a a bit intense, Uh, (laughs) scare them off. Or they might just think this feels like too early for that conversation. And I think we kind of chatted about this, about what we would both do in that kind of situation and had slightly different, but I think connected answers. So we thought it'd be useful for you to hear those kind of two different points of view. So my starting point would always be to share what I'm already doing. Certainly in a new job, I don't think I would spring into life on day two and go, right, here's my big learning plan or anything like that. But I think once I was six weeks in or something like that, found my feet, started to get to know people, started to get to know my manager a bit better, I would probably start to share, oh, I really love to learn. This is an area I'm really passionate about. Or here are a couple of things I'm really, I've been focusing on previously you know things that you've taken with you from your previous role or just started doing yourself and just start to 
share that and just start to share what you're already doing. And I would probably do that, to be honest, without any expectation of kind of anything in return at that moment. Because for me, I think I would just want to be planting that in somebody's mind. And for me, it would give me good, I think, motivation and commitment to keep going with those things. And sharing those sorts of things with my manager would always feel very authentic to me, very much reflective of kind of who I am and the way that I work and just how important learning is to me. So I think I would want someone to know that. But probably initially, I think I would kind of ease my way in by sort of sharing just the things that I was already doing. And I think I would probably maybe less ease my way in. (laughs) I think I would probably talk quite excitedly about the stuff I was passionate about so let's say I joined Microsoft and I'm doing a marketing role I would probably say some of the areas that I'm really passionate about are new products and insight and innovation and if there are any opportunities for me to learn about how this organization approaches that and maybe share some stuff I've done in the past with anybody or just get involved I'd be really really keen to know about them so I think that I would signal quite early on and when I say I think I have done (laughs) signal quite early (laughs) on the areas that I'm particularly passionate about and that what that has led for me practically it's meant that quite early on I've had managers who've connected me to people in the organizations who work in those areas so it's helped me to build my network of like like like-minded people and made me feel like I belong quite quickly because I sort of found my tribe who were also keen about the same things so even if it didn't mean I was working on those projects it meant that I was connected to those people which just helped me feel motivated. And on the flip side of this, so I think one of the best things that managers can do, so if you've got somebody new coming into your team, I think one of the best things that you can do within the first couple of months is have a conversation about their career and not just kind of go, okay, these are your objectives, let's chat about these in six months. But going back to those stats that we talked about, you know, eight out of 10 people would be more engaged in their work if they had regular career conversations with their managers do it early on. Just talk about, you know, what are you really interested in learning here? Are there any things that you started that you'd like to continue? How important? Just have really open career conversations, but sort of give the person permission to do that. Because pretty much if you look at the data, pretty much everybody wants to do this. And if you can make it okay for that person to talk about their passions, their interests and their ambitions, then I think you're starting a really healthy relationship and back to Microsoft that happened with me I remember in my first like month or two people were talking to me about future roles and possibilities and opportunities and learning and I was like oh my goodness I mean this is slightly overwhelming but also amazing I felt like I didn't have to hide that I was ambitious or interested in multiple things I could be really open and transparent and explore it and it was really really liberating so I think you can be that manager and give that person the permission to have that conversation with you too. And I think back to kind of the question around when's the right time to do it there is also about something about environmental and context scanning I think some organisations you can feel quite quickly that they are very open to these kind of conversations exactly like Helen has just described or you might be somewhere where this is maybe not the done thing just yet and this might feel a bit newer so you might need to approach it in smaller steps or in smaller conversations so even if this is really important to you if you're sort of feeling like oh this could be quite a new thing then you know you might need to just go a little bit slower and just be pragmatic about it and I think that's okay too. One of the podcast episodes that we do want to recommend that we think might be helpful connected to today's content is number 84, which is how to coach yourself. Because I think as we talked about putting your own kind of effort and time into this, there's the career conversations that you have with your manager. And then there's also just how you bring this to life in between all of those conversations with your own coaching. If you're not someone who's listened to all 109 episodes <laughs> and perhaps you pick and choose depending on how you're feeling this week or what feels most pertinent to you, if this feels like a topic you just want to delve into a little bit deeper, we would also recommend listening to that one because hopefully that could be useful. And as ever, you can find all of our resources on amazingif.com. You can find us on Instagram at amazingif and watch Helen's brilliant daily career tips, which is why she gets so many messages on Instagram because she's so amazing. <laughs> And for everybody who is rating, reviewing us and sharing us with other people, we just wanted to say again how grateful we are. I love reading them. We've got a couple of new ones this week, uh, which makes me really happy. And you know what? I don't think we'll be a million miles off. I think we're on about 173 or four reviews. And I think at some point on the podcast, I said, oh, it'll be really good to get to 200 by the end of the year, (laughs) which is still probably ambitious because I know these things are always like an annoying five minute job that you never get around to. But if you can find that five minutes over a cup of tea to do it, we'd be very grateful. (laughs) 
And next week, we're going to be talking about how to ask for help. And that could be about anything to do with your career. But we know from coaching people and the different people that come on our courses that people often really struggle to ask other people for help. Sometimes it can be a confidence gremlin that holds them back. Sometimes it can be a lack of an active network so they don't know who to ask for help. But we're really going to get under the skin of it next week and give you lots of practical tools and tips and advice for how you can ask for more help in your career to help you get where you want to go. So that is next week's topic and we will be back with you then. Thanks very much for listening everyone. Speak to you next week. Bye for now. Bye.